On March 29, 1997, in Jackson City, Florida, three security guards were inside a vault filled with millions of dollars. Suddenly, one of them turns around and finds his colleague standing behind him, pointing a gun directly at his face. At first, he thinks it's a joke. He laughs it off, telling his colleague to put down the gun and stop kidding around. But his colleague isn't joking. This man would go on to become one of the most notorious thieves of the 20th century. For those who are seeing me for the first time, I'm Rami, and I delve into the strange and mysterious stories from around the world. Today, I'm sharing the unbelievable tale of a man you would never suspect of being a thief or a criminal. He spent his life protecting other people's money. Yet, due to immense work pressure and mistreatment, he grew to hate his life. This led him to devise the most audacious theft of the 20th century, where he managed to steal half a ton of money, which was almost 550 kilograms of cash. The story begins in Jackson City, Florida. In this city, there was a company called Lomas Fargo, which specialized in safeguarding the money of local businesses and stores. These businesses had contracts with Fargo to transport and secure their money in the company's vaults. This was done on a weekly, and sometimes daily, basis. Fargo would send armored trucks to the contracted stores, and trained guards, clad in body armor, would collect the money from the stores and transfer it to the armored cars. The money would then be taken to Fargo's headquarters, a heavily fortified stronghold filled with vaults, guards, surveillance systems, and thermal cameras. Fargo was considered one of the safest financial institutions in the United States, second only to the state treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank. Yet, from within this fortress of security, a robbery took place. The mastermind behind this heist was none other than one of the most trusted and vulnerable employees in the company, Philip Johnson. His job was one of the most challenging in the company. Philip Johnson was born in Jackson City in 1964. His role at Fargo was to transfer money from the stores to the armored car. He was the one standing at the back door of the businesses, carrying bags of cash to the vehicle. This job required not only training but also nerves of steel, as he was the most exposed to danger during every transfer. While the other guards were either inside the vehicle or within the stores, overseeing the operation, Philip was the one walking through the streets with the money, vulnerable to potential threats. The other employees worked within Fargo's heavily secured headquarters, which as I mentioned earlier was considered a fortress. If you're still not convinced about how dangerous Philip Johnson's job was, consider this. He faced 11 robbery attempts during his time at Fargo. Each time, the robbers fired at him, and he was hit directly on seven occasions, leading to hospitalizations. Remarkably, none of his injuries were fatal, and he always returned to work as soon as he recovered, never taking more than a week off. Now you might assume that someone in such a perilous position would be handsomely paid and enjoy plenty of benefits. But here's the shocking truth. Johnson wasn't even a permanent employee. He earned just $7 an hour, had no health insurance, and the company wasn't obligated to compensate him if he resigned or was forced to leave. It was a tough situation from the start, but Johnson had no other options, so he stuck with the job for 10 years. By 1997, at the age of 33, he realized he needed to find a way out of his miserable situation. That's when he decided to rob the company. But this decision wasn't made overnight. He had been contemplating it for a long time. According to sources, Johnson spent five months meticulously planning the heist. During this time, he didn't take any action but fantasized about the wealthy life he could lead after the robbery. However, the actual execution of the plan took less than eight hours, spread out over four days. And in the end, he pulled it off successfully. Johnson's years at the company gave him an intimate understanding of its operations. He knew the best time to strike and exactly who would be on duty during the heist. Despite the company's armored safes, extensive security cameras, and guards, Johnson was aware that Fargo's impressive reputation as the safest bank in the United States 
was largely due to the $1.5 million it spent annually on advertising. The company even enlisted U.S. senators and influential figures to help market this image to secure contracts with as many businesses as possible. But Johnson knew the real situation behind the ads. He knew that all the company's money was stored in just one safe, while the others remained empty. He also realized that the best time to carry out the robbery was inside the building, the day before the half-year holiday in early spring. This was when most employees would leave early to prepare for their trips, and the number of guards on duty would drop to a third. This meant 70% of the employees would be out of the building, leaving Johnson to deal with only a small number of staff. Through his close relationship with the company's supervisor, Johnson identified the employees who would be working the first two days after the holiday. He specifically chose inexperienced new hires who had never faced an attack before, knowing they would be more likely to cooperate if they felt their lives were at risk. Another reason for choosing this particular day was that 90% of the companies and stores contracted with Fargo were also on holiday. This meant they would deposit all their money in Fargo's safe before leaving, ensuring the maximum amount of cash would be available for the heist. And as Johnson had predicted, everything went according to plan. At 6 a.m., Johnson and the car driver set out to collect money from various stores. By 6 p.m., the car was loaded with over $9 million. When they arrived at the company's headquarters, the routine security check was conducted by the door guards who verified Johnson's and the driver's identities. The car was then allowed inside without issue. Johnson exited the vehicle to begin transferring the money into the safe, accompanied by two guards who were waiting inside. The first guard, Terry Brown, was going through a period of severe depression and was attending group therapy sessions. The second guard, Dan Smith, was an uneducated employee with no experience in handling robberies. Smith also had a chronic chest condition that made it impossible for him to resist or pose any threat to Johnson. The only complication was that, according to company policy, no guards were allowed to carry weapons inside the safe. This meant that Johnson and the other two guards would have to transfer the money unarmed. All three of them handed over their weapons at the guards' room. The challenge now was how Johnson could intimidate his colleagues without a weapon. Johnson knew there were times when a weapon was stored in the camera room. If the gun was there, his plan could proceed. If not, he would have to abandon the robbery and wait another year. Before starting to transfer the money, Johnson asked Smith to accompany him to the camera room, where Smith usually stayed. Johnson claimed he wanted to remove his armor and drink some water. Trusting him as a longtime employee, Smith agreed and went with him. Inside the camera room, Johnson removed his armor and, in a moment of improvisation, asked Smith if he had anything to brush his teeth with. Smith laughed at the odd request and joked about where they might find a toothbrush at that hour. Johnson suggested checking the drawers. As they searched, Johnson spotted a gun in the first drawer. With this, he knew the plan could move forward. They didn't find a toothbrush, but Johnson brushed it off and said, no problem. Let's get back and finish transferring the money. It's important to note that there were only four people in the building during this time, the three guards and the car driver. The driver left after 15 minutes, leaving only Johnson, Brown, and Smith inside. As mentioned earlier, most of the employees had left for the holiday, so the building was nearly empty. As they continued transferring the money into the safe, Johnson noticed it was already filled with more cash than they had collected that day. Just before they finished, at exactly 7.45 p.m., Johnson told the others he needed to use the bathroom and that they should finish up without him. He made his way to the surveillance room, turned off the cameras, put his armor back on, grabbed the gun, and rushed to the garage before the safe door could close. Johnson sprinted to his van, which he had specifically prepared for this heist. A week before, he had sold his regular Ford car and bought a van instead, knowing his car wouldn't be able to carry much money. The van was large and secure, perfect for transporting a significant amount of cash. Johnson had everything he needed to complete the heist and escape with the money. 
Johnson had already decided that if the police caught him after the heist, he wouldn't resist or try to flee. The van he was driving wasn't built for speed, and more importantly, he felt he had nothing to lose. Under the law, the maximum sentence he would face was about six years in prison, a risk he deemed far outweighed by the potential reward. With his bag in hand, Johnson returned to the safe where Smith and Brown were waiting. Standing at the door, he pointed the gun at them. When Brown turned around and saw the gun aimed at his face, he laughed, thinking Johnson was joking. But Johnson was dead serious. He ordered both men to drop whatever they were holding and step out of the safe without resisting. He instructed them to sit on the floor and put their hands behind their backs. Then, he handcuffed both of them, securing their hands and feet without any resistance. Johnson then escorted them one by one to a small cleaning room, locking them inside. Neither guard put up a fight or made any unexpected moves, indicating that they weren't in on the robbery. Interestingly, during the investigation, one of the investigators noted that the guards weren't cowards. They were actually relieved by the situation. A secret survey conducted among company employees revealed that 80% of them had hoped something like this would happen to management. The administration's treatment of employees was so poor that there was widespread sympathy for Johnson, and the guards had no loyalty to the company. They decided it wasn't worth risking their lives to stop Johnson. Once Johnson had locked up his colleagues, he returned to the safe and began filling his bag with cash, mostly in $100 and $20 bills. After loading the first bag into his van, he debated whether to stop there or take more. Knowing this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, he decided to go back for more. Johnson returned to the building and reopened the cleaning room, checking to make sure Smith and Brown were still securely tied. They begged him not to hurt them, which reassured him that they weren't going to cause trouble. He closed the door and went back to the safe, moving bag after bag of money to his van. He continued this until 10 p.m., periodically checking on the guards to ensure they were still restrained. He only stopped when the van was almost completely full. Next, Johnson entered the surveillance room and removed all the recording tapes from the servers. He then went to the HR office where he retrieved his employee file, which contained all his personal information. As a foreign employee without an official contract, this file was the only record of his employment. By taking it, Johnson erased any trace of his identity from the company's records. He then accessed the company's security system and locked all the doors, ensuring they wouldn't reopen until midnight. This bought him more time to make his escape. Afterward, he returned to the safe, wiped down all surfaces to remove his fingerprints, and locked it. He meticulously cleaned every area he had touched with alcohol. Finally, he went back to the cleaning room, opened the door, and told Smith and Brown to come with him. During the investigation that followed, Brown shared a startling detail. Despite the cramped and suffocating conditions in the cleaning room, where he felt he might suffocate due to his shortness of breath, he and Smith begged Johnson to leave them in the room when he came to let them out. The fear was so overwhelming that they preferred the discomfort of the room to the unknown outside. However, Johnson insisted on moving them one by one to the car. After securing them in the back, he tried to open the driver's door, only to realize that it was locked, with the keys left inside. Left with no other choice, Johnson had to break the glass to get in. This happened around midnight. It's important to note that, according to company policy, the security guards stationed at the external premises weren't allowed to enter the building for any reason. They were completely unaware of what was transpiring inside. Even when Johnson drove out with a visibly overloaded car, the guard at the back gate didn't question it and let him pass without inspection. Johnson continued driving toward his house, where he took Smith out of the car and placed him in his bedroom closet, tying him up securely. Before closing the door, Smith pleaded with him not to leave him there for long. Johnson reassured him with a laugh, saying, Don't worry, the company will come for you tomorrow. Next, Johnson drove to a nearby forest, where he took Brown out of the car and tied him to a tree. 
He chose this location specifically because he knew Brown had breathing issues and thought the fresh air would help clear his lungs after being stuck in that stuffy room. Johnson even gave him a lunchbox, telling him to eat if he got hungry. Brown, surprisingly calm, simply thanked him. Johnson's story later inspired a movie, though the cinematic virgin dramatized the events, portraying the guards as having valiantly resisted Johnson. In reality, according to official sources, the employees were rather cooperative, showing kindness to Johnson. After securing his captives, Johnson disappeared without a trace. The robbery wasn't discovered until the next day. The external guards, returning from the holiday, tried to enter the building but found all the doors locked. Initially, they assumed it was a mistake due to the holiday schedule, but the absence of any guards inside quickly raised alarms. It took an hour and a half to unlock the doors and access the building. At first, nothing seemed amiss, but when they entered the surveillance room, chaos erupted. The company's board of directors was notified, and the police were called in immediately. There were no initial signs of a robbery. The safe door was still securely locked. According to American law, all the money in the company was under the jurisdiction of the Federal Investigation Office, which was the only entity authorized to open the safe. By the time the proper procedures were followed and the safe was opened, it was already 11 a.m. What they found was astonishing. The safe had been emptied in what appeared to be an extraordinary heist. Initial estimates put the stolen amount at $10 million. Reviewing the records, investigators realized that only three guards had been on duty. Initially, suspicion fell on them, leading to search warrants being issued for their homes. However, within a few hours, a new theory emerged. What if they weren't accomplices but victims? Given their clean records and the testimonies from their colleagues, it seemed more likely that they were hostages rather than perpetrators. These three guards, after all, were considered some of the company's best employees. According to sources, the company paid an enormous sum to the Federal Investigation Office to keep the robbery confidential. Employees were barred from leaving the premises or contacting anyone outside during the investigation. The company's leadership was desperate to keep the incident under wraps, fearing that the exposure could lead to bankruptcy. Even the Federal Office was sympathetic understanding that a publicized robbery of this magnitude could destabilize the American economy. If word got out, people would likely rush to withdraw their money from banks and insurance companies, fearing for the security of their funds. Despite these efforts, by 8 p.m., the news had broken worldwide. Johnson had stolen $18 million, and the loot weighed a staggering 550 kilos. As the investigation unfolded, the authorities discovered that Johnson's personnel file was missing from the company records. The first place they searched was his house. Inside a wardrobe, they found Smith tied up, exhausted, and barely conscious. They also found a black sheet of paper detailing the robbery plan. Strangely, the plan was dated 1992, five years before the actual heist. This indicated that Johnson had been contemplating the robbery for a long time. However, a more recent document from 1997 outlined the details of the plan within the company, but didn't mention what Johnson intended to do after securing the money. The police noticed signs of psychological distress in Johnson's home. He had scrawled sad lyrics on the walls, with the most repeated phrase being, How long will I be without love? How long will I be without a wife or children? About an hour after police entered the house, they received word that a group of child scouts had found Brown tied to a tree near Blue Ridge Mountain, close to Asheville, North Carolina. They rescued him and brought him to the local police station, from where he was taken to the investigation office to provide his testimony. Following the interviews with the hostages and employees, the police offered a $500,000 reward for any information leading to Johnson's capture. They were convinced that he couldn't have taken such a large sum of money out of the country without being detected. Three days later, an officer in Asheville reported spotting Johnson's car. The FBI responded by deploying 65 investigators to the area, certain that Johnson was hiding nearby or had stashed the money close to the vehicle. 
However, no concrete evidence was found. Johnson seemed to have vanished without a trace. Two weeks into the investigation, authorities discovered that he had used fake identities to register in multiple locations and had crossed the border into Mexico. The police then turned their attention to searching warehouses across the region, scouring 1,400 of them, hoping to find the hidden money. But despite their efforts, they couldn't recover a single dollar. The search continued fruitlessly, prompting Fargo to increase the reward to $2 million for information leading to Johnson's arrest. The search continued fruitlessly, prompting Fargo to increase the reward to $2 million for information leading to Johnson's arrest. But even this incentive failed to produce results. For four months, the police calmed through commercial and domestic warehouses in North Carolina cities. As a last-ditch effort, the police aired a recorded statement on TV, appealing directly to Johnson. They offered him a deal. If he returned the money, they would consider dropping the charges. However, there was no response, and Johnson remained elusive. Speculation swirled that Johnson had either committed suicide or joined a Mexican gang, until everything changed on August 17, 1997. On that day, an international bus traveling from Mexico to Texas was stopped at the American border for a routine check. A border guard began inspecting the passengers' IDs, when she reached one passenger, he claimed he didn't have an ID, but offered his driver's license instead. Initially, she didn't think much of it, but upon examining the license, she noticed he was American. Curious, she asked why he had traveled to Mexico. He casually replied that he had gone to visit a friend and was now returning. The guard found his answer suspicious, as it lacked conviction and suspected that the man might be involved in illegal activities. When she instructed another employee to search his belongings, they found $10,000 in cash. This raised more red flags. Why would someone carrying that much money choose to travel by bus instead of flying? Taking his driver's license for verification, the guard discovered that the name on it was Roger de Lauder, an American citizen of Mexican descent. However, the man in front of her was blonde and didn't look Mexican at all. Something didn't add up. Despite his calm demeanor, the man was arrested until his identity could be confirmed. As they dug deeper, they found a connection between Roger de Lauder and Philip Johnson. Realizing they might have a lead on the elusive fugitive, they immediately transferred him to the Federal Investigation Office. Upon arrival, an investigator recognized him instantly. This isn't Roger de Lauder, he said. This is Philip Johnson. The border guard who had initially boarded the bus was well acquainted with Johnson's appearance, but he had drastically altered his look. His beard was longer, he wore makeup, and he had become noticeably thinner and worn out. For 10 days, the authorities tried to get Johnson to reveal where he had hidden the money, but he refused to cooperate. He told them that if the money belonged to any company other than Fargo, he might have divulged its location. But because it was Fargo's money, he would never tell them. With no other options, the investigation team shifted their focus. Instead of looking for clues under Johnson's name, they began investigating his actions under the alias of Roger de Lauder. They soon discovered that Johnson had rented a house in New Mexico using the driver's license he had provided at the border. When they raided the house, they found a clue a yellow note marked with the words, Homesteads of the Mountain. Before dawn, the investigation team rushed to the homestead's address. Upon opening it, they were shocked to find all the stolen money inside, with only $100,000 missing, presumably spent in Mexico. What stood out even more was the writing on the wall, echoing the same words they had seen in his home. How long will I remain without love? How long will I remain without a wife and children? Johnson's trial was swift, lasting only one session due to the overwhelming evidence against him. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison, without the possibility of parole. As part of his punishment, he was forced to perform office work for Fargo without pay until he had repaid $60,000 to the company. The freedom and financial security Johnson had dreamed of, and the $7 per hour he earned from Fargo, 
had turned into 25 years of unpaid labor, essentially a form of modern-day slavery. Surprisingly, Johnson wasn't the last person to rob Fargo. Just a few months later, the company was targeted again, but in a different way. If you're interested in that story, let me know in the comments. So, what do you think? Did the poor treatment of employees of the company push Johnson to steal, or was he destined to rob them regardless? If you enjoy these kinds of stories, make sure to like the video. That's our story for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Romney, and I'll see you in the next video.